I'm AG Dubs, and I'm a little horse JS right now, maybe a horse horse JS, because I Celine in last night uh, against my will. But anyways, yeah, AG Dubs on Twitter. Um, you might know me from some of the pool talks. Uh, I don't work anywhere right now, so I'm just going to introduce myself as somebody who makes mistakes. And these things happen all the time. And this talk, depending on how you think about it, could be about making mistakes, but I'm not going to like tread on this too much further. Um, some mistakes were made, you know, we understand this. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about cows in space, right? Because what is my talk even about? Like, does anyone even know? I don't even know, right? Cows in space. Uh, maybe that's not what we're here for. Uh, we're here maybe to talk about art, right? This is some great art that I found on the internet. Uh, yeah, no, I know. Uh, bummer. We have to talk about JavaScript. Yeah, and if we're going to talk actually a little bit about ES6 2015, and I'm not going to say that whole thing every time because I think it's garbage. I'm just going to say ES6, and if you think I'm wrong, I don't really care. <laughs> so, anyways, let's talk about ES6, but uh, you know, it's Ashley, so I'm going to have to talk about something else. And the first thing that I really want to talk to you about is abstraction, all right? And this wouldn't be a good uh, computer talk if I wasn't, you know, going to quote some Dijkstra for you. All right, so here we go. The effective exploitation of his powers of abstraction, bummer on the pronoun, I know, I know, um, must be regarded as one of the most vital activities of a competent programmer. And so I take this to mean that when we're thinking about programming, when we're really doing programming, the behavior that we are doing is abstracting. And it's like, OK, abstract is a pretty abstract concept. So let's talk about the abstraction principle. In another really big tome called Types and Programming Languages, you might have heard of it as TAPL, uh, Benjamin C. Pierce defines the abstraction principle as, each significant piece of functionality in a program should be implemented in just one place in the source code. Where similar functions are carried out by distinct pieces of code, it is generally beneficial to combine them into one by abstracting out the varying parts. And so this is probably something that we all do in our daily lives. It's potentially one of the things that we find most satisfying when we program when we can finally refactor something into this one elegant function. And that's really, really excellent. All right, but I want us to understand abstraction on a theoretical level. And so in order to do the theoretical part of abstraction, I went to Wikipedia and got this. Um, so it's pretty good. Uh, abstraction tries to factor out details from a common pattern so that programs can work close to the level of human thought, leaving out details which matter in practice but are immaterial to the problem being solved. And this is something I want to flag for us. The idea of something being immaterial to the problem being solved. We know as programmers that one of the big things that we also do is define the problem we're solving. And so this is something that's kind of tying that in. And I want us just to kind of flag that. So I'm going to take us on another little adventure uh, before you know I get to that whole ES6 uh, jumbo. Um, so I had the pleasure of working at the New York City Web Development Fellowship in its flagship year. And it's a boot camp program for people who are unemployed or make very little money to take them in six months from basically no programming experience to being a junior developer. There are problems with some of these programs, but this one was awesome. And they are all there. And there are students of mine in this audience. And I'm super proud that they're here. Uh, so yeah, one of the reasons I love teaching, and you know, some people are like, you know, if you can do, if you can't teach, I think that's real garbage. Um, and so when I say I teach beginners, beginners teach me. And a lot of the lessons that are learned that I want to share with you in this talk are from interfacing with beginners on a regular basis. All right, so something that I learned when I was teaching is like for beginners, iteration is really hard. Uh, I was right before I started, I was at this Ruby user meetup, and the dean of the school was giving a talk, and he was like, hey, look at Ruby. Ruby is so awesome. You know, even your mom could understand that Ruby array. Sidebar, don't say that stuff. Moms are smart and cool, don't be rude. Um, anyways, so yeah, he was like, yeah, JavaScript. Yeah, people don't understand JavaScript. He didn't understand JavaScript, so that's also a problem. Uh, but he has this point that's actually like kind of core and really cool. And so you might recognize these excellent hand gesture people here, Abelson and Sussman. They wrote a book that we're going to talk about a little later. But what they say in that book is programs must be written for people to read 
and only incidentally for machines to execute. And this is a really big point. People write programs. People read programs. The computers do stuff over there. All right, we're really here to program for people, and that's something that we need to remember. But there's a little bit of a trick here, because what does it mean to write programs for people to read? People really struggle with instructions sometimes. Um, this is a picture of my door in my cool ranch. Um, anyways, yeah. So yeah, this is, a, this is a struggle sometimes. What does it mean? We don't, we don't really know like, what level of abstraction is good for people to read. All right, so we go back into iteration is hard, and this is like a really neat lesson I met. So with this array.each, like, I had this sinking feeling about it. He's saying, yeah, people can read it. Ruby's great. It's interestingly enough, written in English by a Japanese person, anyways. Um, so yeah, I was like, okay, I, this is not working. Everyone is having a lot of trouble with iteration. This is supposed to be easy, what's going on? And so I'm sitting at my desk one day, uh, and my co-teacher, Blake, he's teaching iteration in Ruby to the group for the first time. And I'm kind of like listening in, and it's not going well. It's like just not working. And it's not because Blake's a bad teacher, Blake's awesome. Um, but I hear this, and I'm like, oh, I really should jump in, what am I gonna do? And I did something kind of bold, which, if anyone knows me, isn't out of character. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to hijack this class. And so I walk up into the class. I'm like, hey, guys, I have an idea. And I'm not sure it will work, but I have an inkling that it might. And what I'd like to do is I'd like you to throw away all the Ruby you just learned. And I just want to teach you iteration in a language that you don't know. And I think it's going to work. I think you'll understand. And people are like, that does not sound like a good idea. I said, yeah, yeah, no, no, no Ruby here. However, JavaScript was awesome for teaching iteration because it expressed the underlying concepts. If we look at it here, I mean, I know all of us uh, maybe don't like writing all the syntax out. I'll get to that later. But when we understand iteration, it's state, condition, increment. I see it right there. But in that Ruby? It's not. And so it was really, really cool that I was able to be like, hey, this is the stuff you need to understand it conceptually, and that's exposed by the language. And you can use this language to teach it. And we didn't teach any more JavaScript for another like three months, but we went back to Ruby and it was fine. We used JavaScript as a teaching tool. And so that's like a really interesting thing to think about. And so I think about a quote from my uh, secret boyfriend here, this like really excellent physics professor, <laughs> Richard Feynman. <laughs> Don't tell my boyfriend. Um, <laughs> he says this, and this is kind of a mouthful, but I think it's very interesting. He says, the real problem in speech is not precise language. The problem is clear language. It is actually really quite impossible to say anything with absolute precision unless that thing is so abstracted from the real world as not to represent any real thing. And so this, I think, really pulls out the conflict we have of when we're programming, are we programming real things? Or are these ideas that we have something else? And should we be trying to turn programming into like real world language? Or should we like go the other direction and decide maybe like that's not the right way to do it? All right. And then we still have this problem of origin, though. And so you may or may not have recognized my cows in space painting, which is a bulls painting by Pablo Picasso. All right, and I think it's a really beautiful, just artistic rendition of what abstraction is, and the fact that it's not just a thing, but it's many different layers. And here he says, and this really brings us to some trouble, there is no abstract art. You must always start with something. After that, you can remove all traces of reality. And that's really what he does in that painting. But we have a question here. When we're thinking about designing programming languages, in particular as tools for education, where do we start? This start problem is a really big deal, right? So I love this picture. I assume that people have seen this before. Uh, but it's a very classic one. It's the only curse word in the talk, unless I mess up. Um, so anyways, yes, it says how to draw an owl, draw some circles, draw the rest of the owl. In a certain sense, there's abstractions we have in our programming languages that do this. They do it to us, and they do it to beginners. And I think we can all agree that it's pretty hard to draw an owl with these instructions. These are really both problems. All right, we're just like a rock and a hard place here. We know that abstraction makes things efficient. 
But we also know that explicit code makes it easier to reason about, which makes it more maintainable, which in the end maybe makes it more efficient. So where do we start? What are we going to do? All right. And so now I will take you on a fantastic journey, a personal voyage, you might say, with Carl Sagan, where we say that each of it begins here inside of our head. All right, so the cows in space, right? We're back to this, all right. So humans are beautiful pattern matchers. We're actually like, just like one of, the, that's one of the best evolutionary aspects of human beings. Like reading books is actually terrible for us. There's no patterns on the page and our short-term memory is terrible, all right? But we love making and finding patterns. And so what we can do, we can look at something like this, right? The sky, and somehow we see this. You see it, right? I totally see it, no? Anyways, someone saw it, and then you got a lot of people to agree. All right, and we form something like this. When we find patterns and we give them names, we build abstractions, and that's really cool. But we need to be careful about the abstractions that we make, because these abstractions turn into ideologies, and those ideologies are where we form our culture and our community. And so you might end up with something like this. This is a real horoscope, by the way, and maybe astrology is real, because I did rekindle my sense of inspiration on Tuesday by dragging my travel companions to the karaoke joint. Um, so who knows? It's like, it's all out there. We have no idea. But what we do need to understand, and like Carl Sagan is like really not into astrology, he calls this fuzzy thinking, and it's like, we saw patterns, but the abstractions we made with those patterns were wrong, because they, they were built on the wrong underlying mechanisms, all right? Like, our personalities are not formed by the orientation of the stars, or at least that's not something I'm familiar with yet. Uh, but we ended up with this, and people do a lot of dumb things and spend a lot of money based on this. This is very real for people. Bad abstractions are real problems, all right? So let's talk about JavaScript. All right, JavaScript. JavaScript has been a delightful beginner programming language because it's lacked a lot of abstractions that other programming languages have. We have libraries that kind of do that for us, but JavaScript itself, we haven't really baked stuff in. And that's about to change a little bit. All right. So JavaScript was invented on September 28th, 1980. That is not true, just kidding. This slide exists because that is when Cosmos came out and I wanted to be on theme. So that's the one reference I've got, all right? And so in this, he says this, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And I was like, yeah, totally. Also ES6. Oh, no, that was me though, not him. It'd be cool if I had his backing though. Um, so yeah, let's talk about ES6 right now. All right. From the spec, we see ECMAScript syntax is relaxed to enable it to serve as an easy-to-use scripting language. Relaxation is awesome. I have been relaxing pretty hard this week, even though, even though I've also been very nervous about my talk. But relaxing isn't like always the right message. Um, sometimes you get something like that. Uh, so when we see that, we have to think, what is the problem to be solved here? Is the goal of JavaScript to be easy to use? Have we asked ourselves that? What is JavaScript trying to solve? Actually, like, what's the problem? What will be JavaScript's legacy? All right, that's a, that's a big question, right? Like, when we go back in time, like, people look back and they're like, there was once this language called JavaScript, and they'll say this about it. And what will that be? I don't know. But it probably has something to do with this. This is an excellent tweet by Lori Voss a little while ago. He says, fundamentally, it is hard to think of a compelling reason a brand new web dev will learn two languages when they can just learn JavaScript. If I could pick any language that would work on the client and the server, it might not be JavaScript, but we don't get to pick. All right, so now let's talk about ES6 classes. You might remember our little robot friend here, and he's warning us about aliens. All right, so sugar makes me sick. Like, actually, I have diabetes. Like, sugar actually makes me sick. But syntactic sugar makes me queasy as well. Um, and part of the reason syntactic sugar makes me queasy is that there's often the chance that it's obfuscating something conceptually below it. All right, and so when I see this, I'm like, 
oh no, what's going on here? All right, so let's go back to the script, right? Even though ECMAScript includes syntax for class definitions, ECMAScript objects are not fundamentally class-based. So it's like, oh, that's interesting. Um, why do we do that, right? So you might not need class syntax. <laughs> uh, anyways, this guy, oh, he's adorable. I love this guy. He has this amazing quote. He says, remember that all models are wrong. The practical question is, how wrong do they have to be? Do not be useful. All right, so how, all right, so how, how bad are we doing here with this class syntax thing? Let's keep reading some more spec. Love reading spec. All right. In a class-based, object-oriented language, in general, state is carried by instances, methods. Uh, state is carried by instances. Methods are carried by classes. And inheritance is only of structure and behavior. In ECMAScript, the state and methods are carried by objects. Well, state or structure, behavior, and state are all inherited. Okay, that's like a lot, and if you have not been reasoning about this, that might be a bit. So what I want to do is there's this guy named Bregenwald, you might know from the internet. He says cool stuff like this a lot. All right, he also wrote a blog post, and I'm not going to read this to you. But what he talks about is that prototypes are not classes. What he says, and when you're teaching classes, you often say, a class is a blueprint. It's a, you basically have a, like a blueprint, and then you can build a house from it, right? Your house is your object, class is a blueprint. Cool. Prototypes and like classes in JavaScript, they aren't blueprints. They're model homes. <laughs> and while you might leave your model home empty, someone could also move in and you could live there. And so that's actually very, very different. Um, <laughs> so JavaScript classes are like, kind of like objects. And they're, they're not really classes at all. All right, I might be saying, go home, TC39, you're drunk. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. This is not a hate talk. I love TC39. Shout out to all the work by everyone in open source who does literally anything. I just want to add a perspective, and I don't want to play down anything that people have built, because those people are awesome. All right, so you could really shoot me down pretty fast by being like, what even is a class? And this is a good question. And like, frankly, the community does not have a good ontology around what object orientation should be, nor really what classes are at all. If you're interested in this, I suggest you look this up. If I had like half more hour, I would like totally go into it, but I do not. Um, but Simula is where it started. All right. What I am trying to say about JavaScript classes and the ES6 spec is that we're trying to maybe do something, like maybe too many things and then we're not them, right? Like, we're just trying a little too hard. You can go to this place right next to Madison Square Garden. It's real. Um, and the reason I, I think about this, and this is the perspective I'm trying to add. Uh, Leslie Lamport, in this great talk called Thinking for Programmers, he talks about writing a lot, and he's, he quotes this cartoon, and the cartoon says, writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. And what I want to say is, Teaching is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your understanding is. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get into a couple of like things like pretty quick. I was going slow. All right, um, so those able and Sussman people, they wrote this excellent tome. It's called Structured Interpretation of Computer Programs, or the SICP. And this was foundational because what it said was, we are teaching programming all wrong. We're teaching syntax. We shouldn't be teaching syntax, we should be teaching concepts. And that is a big change. And like we think about JavaScript right now, and we're like, uh-oh, now we have like a syntax, and that doesn't follow up with a concept. But if we should be teaching program, oh, this is going to be a mess, right? JavaScript will be the introduction to programming concepts for an entire generation of developers, whether we like it or not. That's happening. All right? And so we think about the immaterial to the problem being solved. When we're building these abstractions, we need to realize that one of the problems JavaScript is solving is making entry into web development significantly easier. All right, so this little guy, Peter Van Rye, he's super cute. He wrote up a follow-up to uh, the SACP called the CTM. And he was like, we need to teach programming as a unified discipline. All right, and what this means is just programming languages are tools. 
And like, we need to understand that they are able to address problem and solution pairs. And those are things that we call paradigms. And some programming languages are multi-paradigm, some aren't. But this doesn't mean that there's any bad or good language. It's just a good tool for solving a problem. And he says this, and so he says a good way to organize a programming course is to start with a simple language and then to extend that language gradually. And this is what he calls the kernel teaching method. In his book, he starts people at nothing. And then they build everything up. They build scope. It's really cool. And so in that sense, they're inventing their universe. Their universe is a set of abstractions that they built because they felt the pain of their absence. So yeah, every beginner should write a kernel language. Are we into that? Yeah. Just kidding. That's not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Yeah, instead what I want to take from him is the idea of the creative extension principle. All right, and what this says is again, we build the abstractions we need, the ones that we feel. And in that sense, we build the universe that's most appropriate for the problem we're trying to solve. Ron Jeffries, who does XP, says I think this really well too. This is not something we've never thought about before. It's don't pre-optimize. Always implement things when you actually need them, never when you just foresee that you would need them. All right, so prototypal inheritance is a big part of the JavaScript universe. All right, it's how the apple pie gets made. Vegans, yay. Um, anyways, so I have a summary here. Just basically the slides are online, and if you want to do this, what I'm saying is we need to take an educational perspective when we think about programming language design, because programming languages are tools that do that. And this is not just for beginners. We're all really beginners when we're trying to reason about code. And having our abstractions match the concepts that our language uses is going to make it easier to reason about. I want to leave you with something more, though. So I don't think we're totally lost. Class is going to be in JavaScript, and that's going to be cool. But then there's going to be more specs. And I think we have a really cool opportunity. So I ask, what do we even mean when we talk about programming? This guy is Martin Heidegger. I really, really like him. Uh, he's one of my favorite philosophers. And he wrote a book called What is Called Thinking. And in it, he says thus, the most thought-provoking thing in our thought-provoking time is that we are still not thinking. And this is going to sound a little kumbaya, but take it seriously. Are we programming yet? Like, I mean it, all right? There are people who are radically redefining what it means to program. And if we understand that programming is just abstraction, like, do we need to be sitting at a terminal typing a lot of punctuation? All right? There are people who are really changing that. And I'm kind of pissed, because all of those people are in grad school, and I just don't have enough money for that. And I think, I think that we should be doing it here. Why are we not thinking like this? All right, this is Thomas Kuhn. He's a philosopher of science. He wrote a book about why like, science actually doesn't make progress. It's really about just the re-articulation of language. That aside, he says this, and this is really important. Scientists work from models acquired through education and through subsequent exposure to literature, often without quite knowing or needing to know what characteristics have given those models the status of community paradigms. Like, why are we, we can do better. We have an awesome opportunity to way more radically think about how we extend JavaScript. We don't need to join the cool kids club. Like, I think to a certain extent, some features are kind of like the Abercrombie and Fitch shirt of like language features more in middle school. Like, we can really, really change things, all right? Carl Sagan, I'll end with this. It is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. So I want us to think about our ontology. Think about it a lot. This is like actual work, even though it's not necessarily code. And the key to doing this is staying a beginner, always. You guys are awesome. Thank you. So. I have one last thing in my last four minutes, and this is a shout out again to all my beginner students. When I was a teacher, I, uh, they made me a website, and the website is called Clap for Ashley. And if you happen to enjoy this talk, 
or want to see something on the screen, if you tweet with Clap for Ashley now, it will appear. Thank you. <laughs> so the internet might not work also. No one's going to clap. It happened. You guys are great.